Because he's gone through Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and his parents, Joshua and Israel and Rahab. Rahab. And here he comes to verse 32. And what shall I say more? For the time will fail me to tell you of Gideon, the Barak, Samson, and David and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouth of lions. You get this? Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Vax valiant in flight, fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mocking, scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, mountains, in dens, caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report, through faith, received not the promise. Whoa. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Let me read two verses from chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside ever weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, thank you. You have provided for us in the circumstances of this life that we live now in the, in the magnitude of what you have what you placed, what history has recorded, what history will record about you, your people. And the people of God has a record indelibly imprinted in their hearts, written upon the fleshly tables of their heart. These truths that are, are fastened and fixed for time and eternity, may we live them. May we live them. May we see them, behold them, and be changed, become what these words tell us we're to be, to live and dine in your presence with you, to rise up, go forth in the newness of life, enjoying <laughs> uh, resurrection until we are resurrected when this mortal puts on immortality, glorified. We thank you. We praise you. We bring honor and glory to you. Let these things be manifest in each one of us. May we lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking on to you, the author, the originator, and the finisher, the completion of our faith. Absolutely, we get to function with yours. Amen, and amen, and amen. Glory. Uh, I was reminded a few minutes ago that uh, when you begin to shake, bring, bring light into darkness, darkness is going to rebel. Amen. All right? It's going to raise up. Now, we need to know and become, uh, have to be a living reality within us that Jesus, the name of Jesus, is above every name ever being in earth, heaven, and below the earth. Got it? And he de delegated that name to you, to me. We need to use it and speak it with confidence because darkness doesn't like light, does not appreciate light because darkness is evil. Light came to dispel the darkness. 
Who is the light of the world? Jesus is the light of the world. What did he make us? Lights. Huh? Children of light. Absolutely, John, thank you. Glory. This is truth. This is telling us how we are to live and how we are to act, how we are to minister. And I just get excited about it because I think he's, going to, he's taken us from where we are, where we were, where we are, to something else, to more of him. As he pulls back the revelation of his truth, the word of God, and then tell us to live in it or suggest to us to live in it. Well, I have to change my thinking. Well, change it. That's easy. Well, I might look strange. Might be, be strange, look strange. Makes no difference. I got to stick with Zach and I yesterday. I got to stick my hand. I unzipped the guy's coat and run my hand right in on his shirt. Why? I asked him if he wanted prayer. Basically, that simple. He says he's mad at me. I said, I doubt that. So, explain that a little bit. Because in that context, if he was mad at this guy, he'd have been mad at me <laughs> a number of weeks ago. Okay? As simple as that. But he, he, he loves us. That's who he is, what he does. It oozes from him. Hey, I can accept his love. What'd you do? Got his son over there. Zach was there. We was there. It was in the yard and prayed with him. How'd you know he was going to do that? It hit me, a day, hit me uh, hours before, day before. Pray with him. It's, it's, in that point, I didn't even care whether he wanted it or didn't want it. I knew he was going to be presented with the opportunity. He could, what's, what was he going to say? No. He said yes. Amen. So you become what you behold. What you look at, what you seek, seek, for, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let him add them. They're already here. Let them come forth. I tell you, it's absolutely what we need to do. This series that we're on, we're second week now, and it starts out with, that I may know him. And it's the first part of Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, one. Two is that I, I may know the power of his resurrection. No, no in this case in the Greek is also experience. Actually, one of the definitions is as a man knows his wife. Intimate. Okay? It, we're going to discuss that, not that, but the fellowship of that oneness. That we may know the fellowship of his suffering for being made conformable unto his death. Last week, this statement. From the first day we received until now, but it's still going on. On the first day, we received God's Son. We all experienced that, haven't we? On the first day, we received God's Son. Amen. We received then all God's gift and graces. They were all birthed in us by His Son. All birthed in us. The source dwelling there. Everything was placed in us. Nothing was left out. And here we have John 1, 16, the Amplified. Let me read it to you. For out of his fullness, out of his abundance, we have all received. All that we received has not taken away from his abundance, by the way. He's not diminished. We have all received. You and all? You part of all. All had a share and we were all supplied with one grace upon another. Spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor. Gift heaped upon gift. 
bestowed, downloaded, shared in, with you inside. God has set before us a life of discovery. Keep discovering. This thing is, is refreshed and new day by day. We received his, Jesus' inheritance placed in the saints the first day. It's his inheritance we get to share. God's good pleasure, and by his own counsel, he chose, it was his desire, God made us partakers of all that Christ deserves. Grab a hold of that. He made us partakers. God made us partakers of all that Christ deserves. Wow. Now, the question is, have we known him? His inheritance has been our inheritance from the first day. We received Jesus' inheritance. It's today ours, until now, and on tomorrow. Today, you become what you behold. Behold, look, seek, that ye may know and experience that it is God which works in you according to, according to his will, his decreed activity of his good pleasure. His good pleasure is to minister in this time frame we live in. The blessings of God. Mm. Philippians 2, we're going to look from 13 through 16. We may not look at them all to once. You know, there will be other scriptures that will be tucked in here. So Philippians 2, verse 13 for it is God which worketh where? In, <laughs> you got it, Wug. It is God that worketh in me. That you is me. It is God that worketh in me. Make it personal. Don't, don't leave it as words on a page for somebody else. It is God which worketh in you. To do what? Both to will. Second, to do of his good pleasure. I broke it into three, but there you are. God, well, let me do this with you. Both to will and do. What we are to do in works and deeds that brings the satisfaction of his good pleasure. That's all. That's all we're accountable for. Is that which he wants of us to to bringing the good pleasure of him to be manifested. And it's going to be manifested here on earth in people. So, God worketh in you. If God works in me, can I ask you a question? If God is working, you said me, Wug. Whose responsibility is it for the ministry that comes from there? Is it yours? Well, I, let, me, let me do this. First of all, is it his? Is it his responsibility? He working in you, your responsibility to present yourself. His responsibility still is to work in you. A and B, okay? God worketh in me. Do we see him industriously functioning through us? Mm -hmm. Let me do this. Maybe I was a little premature. I'm going to maybe ask you the same question again. Well, after we look at 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, our sufficiency, or to think of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of who? Interesting enough, he worketh in us, in us, the sufficiency is his. The instance is we present ourselves as vessels on earth. All right? I think the tendency is we assume it's all ours. No way yesterday could we make this guy's heart well. 
I, we didn't have nothing to offer other than the sufficiency of God which is in us, or God worketh in us, both to will and do his good pleasure. What he says he's willing to do. Uh, there's nothing else I can do. Nothing else we could do. Wow. His will and power to work is, in, is the first installment of his grace, so to speak. Encourage us to take full proof of and carry out to the end the salvation that first worked and is still working in us or enabling us. It's not that God does some and we do the rest. You say, how are you going to get out of this, Lynn? Here we go. Hang on. God does all and we do all. All that pertains to him, all that pertains to us. He has responsibility, we have. We can't change the circumstance or the ministry fact, but we can allow him, his expression, to be effective. God worketh in us. Our sufficiency is not of us. Ah. See, God is the proper author, the chief leader, the prince. We are the means of his doing or, or his members, his body on earth. Behold and become doers. Hebrews 12, 2. We just read it uh, a few minutes ago. Jesus, the author and the finisher, God completes and God is the perfecter of our faith, our assurance, our firm conviction, our confidence in him. God producing all while we all do the doing and the ministry. Somebody's already mentioned this morning, we're, we're children of God. God predestined us to the adoption as his children, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to or measured by his good pleasure. Like that. According to his good pleasure, made known unto us his will. His will is to share. His will is to give. He gave his son. He's still giving. Hang on. I'm going to meddle a little. I'll try to get closer. The closer I get, the more people I can't see. Hmm. Here we go. Are you ready? That, verse 15, uh, of Bill will catch up here. Verse 15. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, without censor, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Are you blameless and harmless? without rebuke, without censor, without fault, in the midst of a crooked. <laughs> Taking the Greek word to English, we get the word scoliosis. It results in the inability to stand straight or stand upright. And a perverse nation, to distort, misinterpret, morally corrupt nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Goes right along with the topic before this mor on this morning. Wow. Philippians 2, 3 says this, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. How are we at that? You want me to read it again? Or just ignore it? Everybody voted. Nobody voted, so I vote. Here we go. Let nothing be done through strife, or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. We really, we really eat that one up, don't we? We get all excited about that. Paul revealed that the antidote to strife is lowliness of mind, considering others better than themselves. Indeed, only by pride comes contention. I got to thinking about that. Oh, I'd like to use people for an illustration, but it's probably not safe. 
Only by pride comes contention. I'm trying to put that into the ongoing fellowship between husband and wife. <laughs> only by pride comes contention. Only, only by pride comes contention. Only. So if there's contention, somebody is prideful. Lynn, you ever been guilty? <laughs> Don't vote, Ruth. <laughs> well, all I can tell you is the contention, the basis of it, according to Proverbs 13.10, is contention. A person cannot be in strife without, be, without being prideful. He cannot be prideful without being in strife. Oh, boy. Doesn't that resound to you? Just rings bells, doesn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Caution. Do not become as that. No. No. Our evaluation of others should be based on how God judges. God judges by looking on the inside, not the outside. We need to esteem others on the same basis. Second, to esteem others better than themselves is simply to value them more than we value ourselves. What did Paul say? See, I'd rather go away. I'd rather go away. Didn't he? I'd rather go to be with him. More necessary for you that I stay. He was ready. He made a decision. Did you, when we read Hebrews 11, did you hear that some had their members of their family raised from the dead? Others didn't accept deliverance, as if deliverance was available in some form or fashion, but proceeded to death to obtain a better resurrection. Yet, something more, in addition to this, and there's people losing their lives daily, probably worldwide, for the kingdom of God. And they go, willingly. You and I, in this case, at this point, the worst basically that happens to us, they laugh at us. They try to penalize us because, in some cases, because light offends darkness. Or darkness is offended at light. That light doesn't do the offending. Light is not prideful. Hello? Wow. Hmm. For the record, I'm going on record. We are currently in the midst of the crooked and the perverse. Our standard of life is held up to ridicule. The light in us disturbs their inner darkness. They try to remove the light with misdirection, make-believe, and premeditated lies. Ruth read to me a statement that was, a, in my view, a premeditated lie. A statement of make-believe and misdirection. A statement caused, sourced in darkness because it is talking about destruction. It is humane, the statement went, to cut up babies after birth. They wouldn't allow that to a dog. God is the giver of life. Birth is God's gift to you. It must not be destroyed and cut up. Darkness cannot create life. Darkness only initiates death. I'm going to do this with you. 
I, I don't think I've ever delivered this to a congregation. Uh, Bill, can we have John? Let's start with John 1, 4. In the beginning, the first verse says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it builds towards verse 4. And, of course, he's talking about Jesus. In Jesus was life. That's life as God has it, by the way, Zoe. Uh, in, the, in Strong's Concordance, it's four twos. Two, 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 two. Zoe, life as God has it. Look it up. And the life, God's life was what? The light of men. God's life was the light of men. Got the, got the principle here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Bill, would you, uh, uh, as soon as we get done with verse 9, will you give me uh, 1 through 9, please? Can we scroll it somehow? So here we are. In Christ was life, God's life. And the life, God's life, was the light of men. Verse 9. Verse 9, that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What does he light him with? Verse 4 said life. Can I say this? You will. Who would want to cut up God's life? Hello? Hello? He knew them when they was in the womb. I knew you. I cherished you in the womb. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That was the true light, was light of every man that cometh into the world. Do we see it? You wonder how you came here? You can, theologically, I can take you to different theological positions regarding this. I've only seen this in one little pamphlet. I read it one day, and I don't think I got it. I just ordered a bunch of discontinued material from uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin. In there was this little bitty, two, four-sided, two, two papers, double-sided, and this is what it was sharing. Can we go back to verse 1, Bill, and go from there? If you got them all in a row, that's fine. We'll just read. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who was that? Jesus, verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were what? Made by Him. All things were made by Him. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. They don't know what they're messing with. Do not know. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 7. The Baptist. The same came as for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Verse 8. He was not the light, but was sent to be the witness of that light. And verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth. Jesus was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Is that what it says? Cometh. Cometh into the world. It didn't say came. It said cometh into the world. I made a statement the other day. How did I make that? Do you remember? You told me to remember it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Satan cannot create life. Death is his thing. Well, 
That's a bonus for today. Wow. 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 Verse 16. Going back. Nevertheless, we knit. Oh. We knit. Oh, wrong, wrong book. Uh, oh, 216. Here it is. What's the solution to this? Holding forth the word of life. Life as God has it. That, I may re- that he gave to the Son, that the Son downloaded to you and I, by the way. Life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That's Paul's position. He's telling us to hold out, display the word of life. Zoe defines life as God has it, bestowed, bestowed it, God bestowed it, that life through Jesus Christ to us at the new birth. You become light and life in the midst of darkness. Our actions and attitudes are important to open people up to the word of God. It's like plowing the ground to receive the seed. But it is a seed that produces fruit, not the plow. Sometimes we may not be the wisest instrument, implement in our storehouse. That we rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. God's word that saves people, not our actions. We get to participate. Behold and become the planter of God's seed. Behold, what, become what you behold. 2 Corinthians 3.14. This is a powerful set of verses that closes out 2 Corinthians 3. But their minds, well, but their minds were blinded for until the day, this day, still there, which for all of us, you'll, you'll see it clearly in a moment. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So we see the veil has been removed. In Christ, the veil is gone. That's the point here. Verse 18 of the same chapter. But we all, are you an all? But we all with open face or unveiled face, beholding, looking, as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, are we at peace when we read that? He's changing me from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Boys, even if we don't understand it, it should get our motor going. He's doing something to us. Now, help me to understand it. So here we go. Now, let's look at verses 15 through 17 that builds up to this verse 18. Are you ready? But even unto this day, what day? This day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. That's why we are unveiled, and he is unveiled to us. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Wow. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Simple as that. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You have, he's unveiled to you, and you're unveiled to him, so to speak. Except he already knows it all, don't he? Amen. Yep. Wow. What does these words say and mean to us today? We're unveiled. Let, well, let us seek, see, behold, and become. Hang on, freedom abounds. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. And what are the sons of God? What does it say there? They're free. Did that what they said? Whom the Son of God sets free is free indeed. So, can I do this? Beloved, now are you the sons of God. Free. I'm the son of God. He set me free. I'm his child. I'm free. (laughs) 
That's not complex. Is it? No, I'm free. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know, we see literally and figuratively that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and that is presently like him. Mm -hmm. I don't say these things. The Word of God says them. I cannot back up from what the Word says. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot do that. I cannot hide it under a bushel. I cannot hide the light on a hill under a bushel. He tells us to get it out. Wow. Amen. Hmm. Being sons of God is a present tense reality now. Some people struggle to understand that because they only look on the outside themselves and know what they are from the outside view. But those who are truly born again have brand new spirits that are identical, identical, identical to Jesus. 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect, complete, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we. In, where? In this world. Not the future world, in this world. Okay. That's cool. No one, hear me, no one should have the audacity to profess, profess that they are completely like Jesus in their physical body or thoughts. Understand that. Remember, I said it here, March 24th, 2019. Amen. That's truth. Yet, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is what? One spirit. Not two spirits. One spirit. I'm joined, completely joined in my spirit with him. And then he seals it up. Hebrews 12, 23. Uh, there are some notes I should have read in here. Uh, huh. How do we do this? I don't know, so give me 1223. To the general assembly, the church of the firstborn. Are we the church of the firstborn? We're his church, Christ's church. Is that right? He's the head, we're the body, we're the church, we're the assembly. We are the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Your name's written there. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Inside you is a spirit. It is spirit. Joined to the Lord. One spirit. And, and it is complete. And it is perfect. And that's the way it is. Just. See that word just in that? Strong says it's equitable in character and acts. Equitable. I I told you here a while back, I skipped that part of the definition because I, I couldn't bring myself to say it. Because I have to ask myself the question, if he says I'm equitable in character and acts, who am I equitable, equ equal with? Who is that? Jesus. Can we say that, Wug? The Word of God says it, don't it? Yeah, we can say it. You're not going to get struck dead. He's going to look at you and have a twinkle in his eye and a little smile on his face. Or he may be just flat happy. Wow. Communication is spirit to spirit. Whoa, that's good. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate. For whom he did foreknow, those he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He is the firstborn. We're to conform to that image. Conform. Conform. What's the word conform mean? I never have looked it up. I looked it up. Conform. 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 
Strong says it's made up of two words, sun and morph, meaning jointly formed. <laughs> he foreknew us. He predestined, he determined by his own conscious decision that we be conformed, jointly formed to the image of his son. Oh my, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you see how it keeps following and following through? What he's done and what he's doing. Let's look further at Hebrews 3.18. And here again is what it says. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. No, I think we want. No, I think we want 2 Corinthians. Yep, 2 Corinthians 3.18. I got my Hebrews and Corinthians confused. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's worth waiting for. Okay. For we all, with open or unveiled face, beholding as in a glass, be, we become what we behold, the glory of the Lord are changed, remember? Changed, transformed, transfigured, metamorphosed. This change is so dramatic that the definition used metamorphosis. What is that to that little creepy crawly that flies away as a butterfly? That's different, isn't it? We're different, bless God, that's exactly what we are. We're changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He created a new spirit, perfected. We are today one spirit with the Lord, joined as one created in his likeness. When we turned to the Lord, the veil was removed. He unveiled to us. We beheld him, and as invited, we joined with him. We became one spirit of his likeness and his image. Likeness and image. The last Adam, Jesus, is all that God intended the first Adam to be. Jesus, as the Son of Man on earth, reveals to us the living reality of the image of God. Ephesians 4.24. Excuse me, 4.22. Here he tells us that you put off concerning the former conversation or manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the de deceitful lust. If you went ahead and re read Romans 6.6, 6, you'd find it, it was crucified there. And, but that's another day and another time and another place. But it supports this. We are to put on, put off the old man. Now, verse 424 of the same chapter. And that ye put on the new man, which after God, after God, or God created, he knew in righteousness and true holiness. Wow. Put it on. You put off the old man, now complete the transaction by putting on the new man. Colossians 3.10 defines this for us. Here we go. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The new man is created in the same image. That's not difficult. I just believe it. Believe it. Freely live as a new man created in God's image and likeness. Live and be changed from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Glory being doxa, the character and acts of God and self-manifestation. Glory as Jesus had it. Glory that he passed on to us. This is Vine's definition. If you want to go look it up. John 17, 22, here's what Jesus prayed. And the glory which thou gave us me I have given them. You have what it takes to be changed from glory to glory. It's already placed in you. From glory to glory. Wow. And the glory which thou gave us me, Jesus said to the Father, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. But hang on. He also said, the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world, I want back. So it's not the same glory that he had in eternity past. 
He's going to have it with the, with the crucified, with the resurrection, excuse me, of this glorified person. That glory is restored. Him and the Father light up heaven with their glory. Yet, I get, you get, to enjoy some of this blessing that he has been given on earth. So he becomes our example. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, and we'll close with this. And as we have borne the image of the earthly Jesus, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, the glorified Christ. A promise to you, promise to me. You become what you behold. The glory that Jesus had on earth we have already received. Tomorrow our transformation includes a glorified body. Can you see it? Can you see it? Behold and become. But today I'm to walk as he walked. Glory. Father, thank you. These are wonderful truths. They're written in your word. You just pull, pull another layer of revelation. You want us... Uh, Dale said something this morning. He said, we go deeper to go higher, is what the Lord told him. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're going deeper to go higher. We're going deeper to live at another, with another revelation of truth. We have, as I heard again this morning, the foundation is in. We're laying the framework for the supernatural spiritual house that is each one of us to be be, to each, for each one of us to be, a spiritual house, supernaturally laid, foundation, supernaturally uh, raised, stick by stick, if you will, piece by piece, into your house, where you abide with us always. But until then, as it goes up, you still abide in us, and we get to build this house. There's an, we add another room to it, or another layer, or however it goes, we just recognize that it's you. These things don't come. Don't come. Don't come by us. They come by you. We need to behold. And what we behold, we become. So be it, Father, in Jesus' name. And thank you. Amen.